forward, it's important not only to have a vision, but also to learn and get feedback from reality, from our clients, from uh, what we're actually doing. So Trent Walsh is here as a professional mystery shopper and consultant on giving us feedback in the hotel industry. His uh, dual and Canadian and British background has led him through working with many different hotel chains, Edwardian Hotels, Sun International, and Intercontinental Hotels and Resorts, to name a few. He identified a need for more detailed service feedback within the industry and founded his own company, Leading Quality Assurance, which is now a worldwide leader focusing on luxury hospitality sector. He has personally carried out over 700 inspections at five-star hotels, resorts, and spas across each continent, and he's involved in consulting at the construction stage as well. When I asked him his favorite spa treatment, he said the stone massage. So now you're all going to wonder when somebody orders the stone massage, is it the mystery shopper? <laughs> Trent. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, great to be back in India. Thank you very much for the invite. Uh, the first time I came to India actually was 1989, and I backpacked around this country for three months between here and Nepal on a budget of $10 a day. And I had the most amazing three months of my life. Uh, so it's great to be back, great to see the change in this country, and I have to say, much more comfortable staying at the Oberoi and going to the Taj for dinner. So really enjoying that. I appreciate uh, this is a bit of a change in tack on this uh, conference, what I'm about to talk about. We've talked about mind and soul, and then I'm going to come up and talk about mystery shopping. So it seems we're going a slightly different route here. But I'm going to share with you some of the stuff we're doing in uh, the mystery shopping world in the hotel and spa industry. I'm um, going to share with you some data that's come out of that. Uh, hopefully you find that interesting. Uh, also, tell you what's happening in the industry and what people are using this data for, how they're using it in their, in their spas, uh, and also kind of the new frontier that we're looking at, which is emotional intelligence and, and how we're building that into our mystery audits. So just to give you a bit of background on us so you know who uh, we are, some of you may know, uh, our company's about 12 years old now and we specialize in quality assurance solutions. We think that's a much more scientific way of saying mystery shopping and we think we're a little bit more scientific than just mystery shopping. And our client profile is definitely luxury hotel sector. So we tend to work, well, we work with all of the brands on the screen here, and we work with them on a global basis. So as you can see, we work for the vast majority of the luxury players out there, and we have great geographical coverage. And what that means is we have some great data to share with you as to what we're seeing around the globe. You can see there's one kind of weird one down the bottom corner there, uh, British Airways. It's the only non-hotel client. We did some work with them last year on auditing the, their business and first-class cabins, which made me incredibly popular amongst my staff. They thought this was the best thing we'd ever done. I'll give you an idea of size. We do about 1,500 audits worldwide now. Uh, we work in 116 countries and across all six continents. Uh, so we have great coverage. Um, and just to briefly explain how it works, we tend to spend uh, three days and two nights in each hotel. Team, uh, t tends to be the typical inspection. We measure everything from check-in uh, to check-out and everything in between. So bars, restaurants, spas, housekeeping, concierge, everything that goes in there. Um, slightly different to some of our competitors, it's real-time reporting. So we do the entire audit on site. So when we come to your lovely spas and we're finished and we're feeling very relaxed, we then have to go back to our room, open our laptop and write up about it. So it's completely done when we check out of the hotel. Um, we, at, when we check out, we announce ourselves. So we'll say, my name's Trent, I've just been here and audited your hotel, can I meet with the general manager? They come out. Mm sometimes happy, sometimes not so happy to see us. Um, and we sit down and have a conversation, tell them this is what we thought was really great and these are the kind of things that we think you need to work on a little bit more. Um, we then send our report back to our office, someone proofreads it and we upload it to the website. And when we upload it to the website, the client then has access to see that report. But probably more importantly, when we upload it to the website, all of the data associated with that report also goes up to the website. And then what we're able to do is start slicing and dicing that data in different ways to make it meaningful to our clients. Okay, so the picture I'm showing you here, and I won't go into great detail, but when they log on to our site, they're able to go to a dashboard, and that dashboard has already taken the data and sliced and diced it in many different ways to make it meaningful to the client. So they're able to see how they're doing. And I'll talk, come back to that a little later on. 
So obviously our business is primarily hotels, um, but as we do about 1,500 hotels, we also do about 1,500 spas worldwide because most of our clients have uh, spas. But we did a nice piece of work and we continue to do a nice piece of work with leading hotels of the world and their leading spas program. And some of you will know about this and some of you will not. So if I just briefly explain what that was about. When leading spas was created as a package program within leading hotels of the world in an effort to promote revenue. Um, and what they said is they wanted to create this and, and some hotels within the leading membership. So there's 420 hotels in the leading hotels of the world and we all audit all 420 of them. And most of them have spas, but they wanted to have some kind of filtering system as to which hotels would be in leading spas and which ones were not allowed to be in leading spas. So ones like the one on screen here were not allowed to be in leading spas. And we had quite a few hotels, I have to say, that initially applied that had a converted bedroom with a bed in it that they said, that's our spa. And we said, well, that's not really what we're looking for, but good, good luck on that one. So we what we did is we put together a uh, committee, and on that committee uh, we had some international spa consultants, so Susan was on that committee. Um, we had uh, hoteliers, we had consumers, and we sat around and we said, let's develop best practice standards in the luxury spa sector. And then let's create an audit that's both quantitative and qualitative, so they can get some scores and then they can, get, they can read about it and get some feedback. Uh, and then what had to happen is the hotels had to apply, they had to pass, and then they would be, become part of the, the leading spas program. That was the concept. So when we sat down to go through the standards, we decided to break it down into five sections. We broke it down to spa minimum standards, uh, spa operations, spa product, spa treatment, and then fitness facilities. And then in each one of them, we broke it down further, as you can see on the screen there. And we created standards for each one of those sections. And so what the report ended up looking like was a little bit like this. So it's a checklist to start with. You either meet the standard, you don't meet the standard, or it's not applicable. And that will give you a score for each section. We then do the written narrative afterwards, as I said, and we tell you about the experience. So we talk right, you know, the agent entered this, this spot at 1422 and was meted by Susie. And we'll go through that and tell you exactly what happened during the process. And then all those scores go onto a summary sheet, which gives you an overall score for the hotel based on those five sections. Okay? So we did that, and what did we find? Well, we found a few interesting things. The first thing we found, if we go regionally, um, we found great variation by region. So that was quite different to the hotel world. In spite of popular myths, you know, everybody says, but in Asia, the hotel score so, is so much better than the ones in North America and Europe. We don't find that in the hotels. We don't find that. We find very little variation between the different regions. But when we came to spas, we saw great ranges, big differences by regions. But looking at the regional data on its own doesn't really tell a complete story. Uh, so we broke that down a little bit more, and we said, well, let's just look at a few countries within the different regions. So if we look at Europe, you know, it, it kind of makes sense when you think about it, but Germany and Switzerland tend to sc score quite highly. It's a mature market. They've been doing it for a number of years, and they do very well. Whereas when we, saw, when we look, started looking more emerging, emerging countries, we found that they tend to do quite a bit um, lower scores. So you see Morocco there, 59, Russia, 68.8, uh, China, 69.7 or sorry, sorry 75.6, Spain 69.7. I know Spain is not an emerging country, I recognize that, but it's just one of the lower scoring ones, so I, I did put it on there. So we saw quite a bit of difference both regionally, and then when you broke down those regions, even within the region, there's quite a lot of variation. When we started looking at the departmental scores, um, we also found some interesting stuff here, something that came up very clear. This is actually a, a slide from 2013, but. If we went back in history when we started the leading spas program, what became very, very clear is what hotels did very, or spas did very well in were fitness facilities and spa product. So product-related scores, they tended to do very high, and the two things that they tended to do quite low on were the actual spa treatment and what we call spa operations, okay? So anything with people in it would be the answer, tended to be lower, and anything that was very product-driven tended to be much higher. So what that told us is people could build very nice spas, but not necessarily run really great spas, okay? So the, the things that came out of it, um, definitely pro spa product was strong, fitness facilities very strong, uh, the promotion of the spa within the hotel very, very strong, and technical ability of the therapist very strong. 
The things that came up over and over again on the negatives, um, absence or limited SOP manual. So one of the, part, one of the things of the Leading Spa Program, when we'd announce ourselves, we'd meet with the spa director and we'd go through the report with them and say, okay, I need a little bit more information before I can finish my report. Can you show me your SOP manual? And often that was just, there's a blank look on the face. <laughs> well, that's not here. Well, where is it? Well, that's with the HR department. You know, what we found is they were either absent or minimal. And if I again compare that to the hotel industry, that's quite unusual. The hotel industry is all about SOP manuals. You'll find them in every hotel in the world. Whereas in the spa, we didn't tend to find that. Or if we did, it's quite limited in content. The second thing I would always ask them, can I get a full list of training records for your therapist? Blank look again. Okay? And again, if I compare it to the hotel world, they'd easily be able to show me the training records. So what we found, those are the kind of areas that really stood out to us. When we talked about the treatment, what we really found, minimal pre- and post-treatment. So very, what we found, a lot of the spas very process-driven. You come in, in there, take your clothes off, do, 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 okay, off you go. And what we're saying is they should be sitting down and saying, so let's, let's talk about what you want to get out of today. Let's find out a little bit about you, a little pre-consultation. Then at the other end, instead of rushing them out for the next appointment, you know, escorting them to the relaxation room, some post-treatment advice. And we were finding that wasn't happening. So there's a real lack of personalization in the treatment area. So those are some kind of big picture findings, but what do our clients do with this data? So our clients are able to do a lot more with that data. Uh, here's a slide, and I'll, I'll just explain what we're looking at. So this is Germany. So what we do, uh, it, when they come to our site, they can log on, and they go to their dashboard, and they can start drilling down on different reports. And one of them is called the Competitor Analysis Report. So this lists all the hotel spas, or sorry, all the hotel spas, you know, hotel spas in Germany that we audit. On the right-hand side, we actually list them. Uh, on the left-hand side, you'll see a graph, and we tell you, here's their scores. But we don't tell you which spa scored which score, obviously, for client confidentiality reasons. What we do, do is highlight your scores. You're able to actually see, based on my recent audit, where do I rank in Germany compared against these other hotels? So it starts making the data a little bit more meaningful. We then have something called a traffic light graphical display, uh, which allows our clients to see how they do from a benchmark point of view. So from you know, this slide shows you it. Um, all those hotels in Germany, the average scores are represented in the blue bar in those different sections. And the hotel, this is a sample hotel, but the sample hotel in this question would be representing green, yellow, or red. Green meanings we're at or above the competitive set average. Yellow means we're up to 5% below the competitive set average. And red means we're more than 5% below the competitive set average. So what we're able to do is tell the clients, um, based on your last inspection report, here's the areas that you really need to work on if you want to compete with your direct competition, right? And we're also able, if for those that are really like the detail, we can even drill it down by individual standard, and we can tell them, here's the number of opportunities to meet that standard, this is how many times you missed it, this, that, therefore, this is a percentage miss for that particular standard, right? So we can really go from big picture all the way down, and that's how our clients are currently using it. So what's the next frontier? The next frontier that we're looking at is developing, or we have developed, and we continue to develop, is an emotional intelligence, emotional intelligence element to what we do. A very good example of emotional intelligence uh, right here in this hotel. So the other night I got home, there's a little letter on my desk that says, uh, Mr. Walsh, we noticed that your toothpaste had run out. So we've replaced it for you with the brand that I use of toothpaste, right? So to me, that's great emotional intelligence because they're watching, they're looking at what's happening. They also know I am a hotel inspector, so it may have something to do with it, right? But <laughs> Vikram, I'm sure they do it for everybody, right? But uh, we'll, we won't go there. But that, there's a great piece of emotional intelligence, though. That's what, exactly what we're looking for. Are they taking the signals and are they, taking, are they adapting the service and are they delivering it? Another. Let me give you a bad example that didn't happen in this hotel, it happened somewhere else. I checked in a hotel um, just last week. Um, a long flight arrived at the hotel, and uh, they escorted me to the room, and they said, would you like me to show the room? And they said, it's 1.30 in the morning, right? So I, you know what? I stay in a lot of hotels, I'm okay, I'll find my way around, it's okay. She says, okay, let me just do a brief orientation then. And then she proceeded to do the whole orientation, I, you know, air conditioning, here's the safe, here's this, here's that. And so, from an emotional intelligence point of view, very 
unintelligent, right? Because from a guest point of view, you're not listening to what I'm saying. I've made it very clear what I would like. And I'm not a grumpy guy, don't get the wrong idea. I, but if you tell them, we're, we're expecting them to pick up on that and, and adjust their, uh, their service. Um, so on the emotional intelligence, um, what we're trying to do is get that customer sweet spot right in the middle. We think standards compliance is incredibly important. You know, getting the basics right every single time is really important. Uh, so we think that standards compliant piece you have to do these days. That's the expectations. We think the next frontier is really the emotional intelligence and those kind of examples that I just gave of taking it to the next level and really understanding the client, adjusting the service style to that client, personalizing it, making it anticipatory, making it intuitive. And if you get those two together, then you hit utopia, right? Then you hit Oberoi, right? Oberoi does this incredibly well as a brand. So what we've been doing over the last year is quite a bit of work on it. Uh, we hired uh, an outside company in the UK that specializes in emotional intelligence. And they reference Goldman, who, if any of you read about emotional intelligence, Daniel Goldman's kind of the guru of emotional intelligence. And what he did is he breaks down emotional intelligence into four quadrants. And in each one of those quadrants, he says, these are the expected behaviors that we would expect. So we looked at these and we said, well, listen, we're mystery shoppers. Some of these things we can do. So things like empathy, service orientation, we can measure them quite effectively, we think, when we're in the hotel. And then other things we think we can't. So inspirational leadership, it's very difficult for me to determine if Vikram is an inspirational leader by staying in his hotel as a mystery shopper. I'm unable to do that. So we said, well, let's just concentrate on those things that we think we can measure effectively in mystery shopping. So we narrowed it down, and then let's develop some standards around those. So you can see here, you might not be able to read it on there, but there's, these are kind of our emotional intelligence standards that we're using these days. And you can see I've highlighted a few uh, words in red, confidence, uh, intuitive, anticipatory, uh, self-control, personalization. So we've taken some of those behaviors that were expected, built it into the standards, and then we're testing um, the, the hotels on this or, and the spas. And then in the narrative side, we still carry on telling you about the experience, the compliancy, but then we also add on the emotional uh, narrative. So we talk about, they said this, it made me feel like this, right? So my inspectors are loving it. For years I said, you know what, I don't care if you like it or not, you just tick the boxes, that's what you do, right? Now I'm saying, actually, I really care if you like it. <laughs> now I need you to tell me, did you love it or did you just kind of like it? And then I need you to explain why that is. And the feedback I'm getting from the consultants is they're saying, this is fantastic, this is, I love this. And equally, the feedback we're getting from our clients is this is exactly the direction that we want uh, to go. So uh, I'll finish off on a couple slides there. The first one is uh, implementing quality assurance. A lot of people say to me, well, Trent, how do we, you know, we get all these reports and we get all this data, how do we improve? I want a higher score, I want to be the best in my city, I want to be the best in the world. Uh, so how do I do it? And I always say, you know, a quality, the quality assurance process is actually very straightforward, what you need to do. Um, the execution is what's very, very difficult. So we say, uh, the first thing uh, it, that you must do is communicate the standards. So coming back to the example I gave of the SPA, no SOP manuals. If there's no SOP manuals, then I question, how does the employee know what is expected of them? And if they don't know what is expected of them, how can they possibly deliver the standard? They can't. All that you can possibly achieve with that is a very inconsistent service. So somewhere there's got to be a reference point to say, this is what we want to do as a brand in terms of service delivery. So A, you must communicate it. The second thing you must do is you must train it. So just because you have told someone what you expect them to do does not mean that they can automatically deliver it, so they need some training on that. The third thing you need to do is you need to audit it. You can't fix something if you're not measuring it. Right? So there has to be some form of audit process uh, that you're, you're carrying out. You then need to analyze it. So if you've audited it, you get the results, and you have to say, okay, well, let's look at what was good, what was bad, what are the areas that we need to improve upon. And then finally, you need to take action. So you, you've, had the, you've, on, you've communicated, you've trained, you've audited, you've analyzed, then you've got to say, okay, well, what are we going to do about this? How are we going to make it better, right? So often when I meet with a GM, they'll say, oh, Trent, we had a horrific inspection. Terrible, terrible. So what we're going to do is we're going to fire the front office manager, fire the housekeeper, and fire the food and beverage manager. You think, not exactly what I was looking for, right? So what we're saying, what we'd like you to do is go through the quality assurance process, 
Make sure you're ticking every one of those boxes. And if you still got a problem at the end of it, then you can start firing people. But first, you got to make sure that you're giving them the tools to deliver the goods. I will finish with my last slide, and I think I've almost done it to, to the minute, which is pretty good. I'm happy with that. Um, I think it's a very good quote to finish with. It comes from within India. A customer is the most important visitor on our premises. He is not dependent on us. We are dependent on him. He is not an interruption in our work. He is the purpose of it. He is not an outsider in our business. He is part of it. We are not doing him a favor by serving him. He is doing us a favor by giving us an opportunity to do so. And that's from Gandhi. I think it's absolutely perfect. Thank you. Can I take a question? I don't know if I'm great. taking. You can take a couple of questions. Okay, yeah. We're going we're gonna to be able to take a couple of questions. I'm sure you have a million questions. In the back, in the green? Yeah. Hi. We have, oh, we have one there. Great. Sorry, I'm... I wait, 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 she's got the mic coming. There, there you thanks. go. Stand up, please. As long as they're not a client. It's a, so she's asking, can you do I mystery under, shopping yeah. of another uh, Yeah, spot? so as long as they're not a client. So I wouldn't spy on one of my current clients for another client and for conflict of interest. Requested, but you knew it was an integral part of having complete data. Would you mystery shop it without having it be a client? You know, we do that in the hotel world. Uh, we don't currently, the answer is we currently don't do that in the spa. So for, in the hotel world, because um, our data is really quite amazing in the hotel world, and the example I always give up until this year, for, we, o we only started working four seasons this year. Prior to that, we didn't. And in Paris, we worked with all of the top hotels in Paris with the exception of the George Sank. And everybody say, well, without the George Sank trend, data's good, but it's missing a pretty big hole there, right? So we used to go and pay at our own cost to get the data on the George Sank. And if they had a spa, yes, we would do that as well. It's a very, not the most cost-effective way to run your business, I can tell you. So we're very happy they're now paying us to come and do it instead of us paying to stay at their hotels. <laughs> so to, to answer your question, um, we don't currently do that with the spas. Um, we don't have that demand at the moment, but I'm happy. Talk to me at the break. There was another question that. over there. Thank you. Um, one of my considerations that I um, really worry about in the spa industry, I am actually a, a trainer. Okay, great. So I train the professionals to do the service. Right. But the standards that they're marked on, if I take Forbes or something like, ask them about, to mention their name three times, to check pressure, to check lighting, to check all of the things that have nothing to do with the treatment, which to me is a little disturbing. Sure. Because it interferes with the connection and the communication and the flow. So one of my concerns on the other side of this, of meeting those check marks, beginning and closing, absolutely not a problem. But who's really doing the training for your people so that you understand this? <laughs> oh, okay. Well, uh, yeah, I get who's, asked a is, lot. This is that question of who's checking the checkers. Who's checking the checkers? Uh, well, I did have a slide on that, but we only had 20 minutes, so I cut out the slide. But just briefly on it, we have 40 full-time people. This is what they do for a living. Uh, those 40 people probably have, well, they do five hotels a month, so five treat. They have 60 spa treatments minimum a year. <laughs> Right? I don't want that so, job. So, yeah. yeah, I was going to put that on as a joke, my email address, because that's generally after most conferences, I just get applications. I don't get business, I just get a lot of applications. But anyways, um, so my, my point being, they're very, I get the same question when we talk about restaurants, and they say, you know, but what do you guys know about food? Well, the reality is more than 99.9% .9 of the population does because they're experiencing it day to day. But I take your point on the standards. In actual fact, as I said, when we developed the standards, we did invite in, Susan was a huge contributor to it. So we had people from the industry um, giving us advice on that. And in actual fact, we're going back to the drawing board on the 21st of November to revisit them once again. So it's not something that's static that we just say, okay, we've done it, let's forget about it. We continue to relook at it. One last point on that. This year, I actually hosted a forum in New York where I invited 
18 of the brands that we work with, 14 of them showed up and we went through the standards line by line for two days. So we're constantly re-looking at those standards to make sure they're relevant to the industry. Great. I just have one other point on that. Sure. How do, how do you, I'm sorry, it's the same thing, but how do you measure? Do you just mes measure massage or do you measure hydrotherapy treatments and other things as Full well? range. Full range, yeah. We have time for one last question. Sure. Maybe, okay, up here. Hi. I, I was wondering, the, uh, do, you, do you foresee in the future the ability to take, you know, the, the great process that you've got and then sort of weave it with uh, actual operational data from, from systems where you can, you can start to augment where actually you're getting guest feedback from surveys and, and other types of things where they can actually tie those metrics back to the actual service providers too so there's real accountability and, and it, it's not just sort of a, like a box tick, but there's, yep. there's you know, being able to, because obviously you've got great metrics and, and great analytics, so being able to have that, do you foresee that in the future? Uh, I foresee it. Yeah. Uh, I, in fact, I, I, most of our clients are talking about that. I think we're all just trying to work out how do you do it, because ideally what my clients say to me is, love the dashboard, love your technology. It would be nice if I could just go to one website rather than, you and then go to my guest satisfaction and then go to my employee satisfaction. So they would definitely like that integration, so would we. The problem then comes, I've got to go to a guest satisfaction service provider and say, okay, can you just migrate all your data across to my website? That's where it always is a problem, right? And everybody goes, oh, you can't see my, you can't see that as, and I, I mean, I'd, I'd be the same way with our data. I wouldn't give it to them either. So, but I think the answer is, it will come. It, it will have to come, because yeah. that's what the client wants and ultimately, that's what they get. Great. I think there's still there's enough. Yeah. I think we're good. Thank you so much, Trent. Thank you.